Hi, my name is Jadran Kubrkic from Freedom and Prosperity TV. Just recently here in Hong Kong, I was lucky to meet and interview a renowned libertarian thinker, Dr. David Friedman. David Friedman is also an author, economist, physicist, and legal scholar. And he is currently a professor of law at the University of Santa Clara. He has written several books, most notable of which is The Machinery of Freedom, and which talks about his version of free society, the so-called consequentialist anarcho-capitalism. In our conversation, we explored some of the solutions as well as potential pitfalls of anarcho-capitalism. And at the end, Dr. Friedman gave his take on viable and useful ways of advancing libertarianism in general. Dr. Friedman, thank you for having us. I thank you for inviting me. Uh, most people, when they hear the word anarchy, they associate it with chaos. Uh, most people in socialist countries, like, such as former Yugoslavia and Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, uh, they also associate chaos with the word capitalism as well. Would that apply to people in the former socialist countries who had visited the the, the West? That my impression, I was particularly struck reading about uh, the Chinese experience, where apparently after Mao died. Uh, various leading Chinese figures finally got to visit the West and were astonished to discover how much more attractive it was than their system. There's a quote from the person who I think at the time was Premier of China uh, when he visited England and discovered that the salary of a garbage collector in England was four times his salary as Premier of China and his comment was that England would be the perfect communist society if only it had a communist party ruling it. And my impression was, at least from China, that one of the things that contributed to the changes in China was when a lot of people discovered that China's economy was in fact much worse than that of the capitalist West, just by visiting and seeing that people in the workers in the capitalist West were much better off than people in China, that the stores were full of goods, that you could buy groceries and food and all the rest of it. Uh, and I would have thought that people from uh, the Soviet and satellite countries who actually visited the West would have been struck by the same thing, that things were, were better off. Now, people who had never been outside of, of those countries might well believe the official government line according to which capitalism is chaotic. And, of course, there's a certain sense in which it is chaotic. That is to say, it's a decentralized rather than a, a centralized uh, system. That, that One of uh, my father's stories from uh, visiting China back probably after Mao's death, but before things had changed a lot, was speaking with somebody in the Ministry of Material Supply whose job was making sure that firms in China got the inputs they needed. And he wanted to know who, if he visited America, who had the same job in America so that he could talk to him. And of course the answer was nobody does. That in America, firms get their inputs, but they get them through prices in the market system. So the real answer was either everybody or nobody, uh, in that it's a, a decentralized system. So it's chaotic in that you can't draw a picture saying A gives orders to B and C, who gives orders to D, E, F, and G, and then things happen. But the centralized, uh, in that sense, orderly system works very badly on a large scale, that centralized control works for very small groups, for a football team or, or a small firm. But the bigger the population gets, the harder it is to run it from the center, because the information needed to know what you should do is dispersed, that you know your abilities, someone else knows his abilities, another person knows what goods he wants, uh, somebody else knows details of the, 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 the local situation and so forth. and if you try to funnel up all that information through a narrow channel to somebody at the top make decisions, you lose most of it. And then you funnel down the orders, and since people are doing things not because they want to do them, because somebody's told them to do them, they have an incentive to try to game the system. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the what was supposedly a joke in the Soviet Union, that it was a perfectly fair system. Uh, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Uh, whereas if you're making decisions for yourself, if you're growing food you're going to eat or food you're going to sell and then use that money to buy things, you have an incentive to really work because if you don't, you really won't get your crops grown. Uh, 
So in that sense, it seems to me that the decentralized system is much more orderly than the centralized system, but it is harder to understand and therefore less organized. Less, you, you can't draw a simple structural picture of it, so to speak. All right. Um, well, um, uh, now, uh, you are a proponent of anarcho-capitalism. So uh, how is uh, anarchy and capitalism uh, not chaos together? Uh, for the same reason that capitalism isn't. Because a decentralized system in which individuals cooperate, coordinate their activity by voluntary association rather than by authority, uh, produces generally quite orderly uh, results. And we see that in a lot of, of, of different, different contexts. Uh, that uh, there is nobody in charge of making sure that there are enough watermelons in grocery stores in America, but if uh, there aren't. The price of watermelons goes up, and when the price of watermelons goes up, it pays grocery stores to carry more watermelons because they make money doing it. It pays farmers next year to grow more watermelons because they're a profitable crop. So you have a decentralized signaling system in which prices convey information about what people want and what they can do. And the idea of anarcho-capitalism is to carry that logic all the way to replacing all useful things that governments do by private alternatives. So that you would not only have decentralized and voluntary mechanisms for producing groceries, but also for protecting your rights, protecting you against criminals, settling your disputes with other people, uh, the various useful things governments do. Now, there are quite a lot of things that people take it for granted that governments do, which you could eliminate without having anarchy. That is, if you think about the range of things governments do in the modern society, there are some things which some governments do and some don't. For example, well, medical care, I'm not sure there's any society where government is not heavily involved in it. The U.S. is claimed to have a private system, but about half of all expenditure is by governments. Uh, but higher education, in the U.S., universities and colleges are sometimes run by states and sometimes entirely private. Uh, K through 12 education in the U.S. is mostly run by state and local governments, but some private schools. There are some countries where all the universities belong to the state or where all the schools belong to the state. You could perfectly easily have a capitalist country in which education was entirely private. Uh, that was the situation in England up to about 1830, for example. Uh, and it would, still be, it would still have a government, so it wouldn't really be an anarchy. Similarly, there's no particular reason why money ought to be produced by governments. And there are lots of historical examples of private monies that when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, the Scottish money consisted of private bank notes issued by private banks. So one could go quite far in the direction of replacing government with capitalist institutions and still have a government. The point at which it becomes anarchy, I think, is the point at which you try to replace all of government with private institutions. Uh, and that we don't have a good example in any modern society, although there have been a fair number of earlier societies where you didn't have a government uh, and, and nonetheless, well, most of the time, people didn't get killed or robbed or whatever. Uh, so as I say, so basically, uh, what I would think of as the moderate libertarian proposal would involve getting government out of everything except police courts and national defense, which were traditionally thought of as the fundamental functions of government. And then, to me, the interesting question is, can you carry it one step further and replace those things as well? And that's a harder problem, but I don't think it's an insoluble.